everybody thinks that all the theme parks are competitors. And we are. When you go to Orlando, you've got, so you could almost count up and say you got at least 12, if not more than that, parks in that general area of Orlando and Tampa. And yes, the theme parks are competitors uh, to a degree. But when it comes to safety, everyone are fierce friends. Okay. And the thing about ASTM is you go to ASTM and you could be sitting with somebody from several other parks and you're sharing ideas and solutions. And, you know, when it comes to safety, there's no barriers. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Fantastic, Josh. I'm not even going to ask if you want to know because you asked. So I'm going to tell you it's fantastic. Good. I'm, you know, I'm really glad you're doing fantastic fantastic today. (laughs) Matt. Yes. I have a fun fact that I had this realization yesterday and I'm excited to share this fun fact. I don't know if you've had this realization too. Um, there, there, there could be a lot of fun facts that you might be referring to. So <laughs> can you narrow it down or are you just going to tell us the, fun I'm just going to get right to it. So, Bring. so we've been doing this podcast for a little while. We are into the hundred and nineties now of the episodes. And if you take all of the guests that we've had on this podcast so far and added up all of their years in the attractions industry, we very easily have created a podcast that features more than 1,000 years of attractions industry experience. Now, did you actually do the math? You know, I didn't do the math. <laughs> and in fact, I think it could be way more. I think it'd be, it could be closer to 2,000. It could be. It could yeah. be. I thought you were going to say, if you laid them end to end, you could get from here to the moon and back. You could circle the earth seven <laughs> times. <laughs> That's funny. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you're bringing that up because of our guest today. You know, I think it ties in really nicely because now the combined years of experience uh, boosts even further. John Riggleman uh, has been in the industry since the 70s. He has just retired uh, from such a prosperous career working for Cedar Fair, for Universal, for SeaWorld, for Hard Rock Park. Uh, and he's made just such an amazing contribution, I think, to the industry and everything that he focuses on from safety standards and risk management and rating procedures. And I'm so excited to chat with him today. I am too. And one thing that I really appreciate about John is the way he talks about his team and how important young people are in the industry and bringing people up and mentoring them. Um, Obviously, he himself, like you said, has has had a huge impact. Um, But I think it's also in the generations that will come after that, you know, kind of have have that ripple effect of his of his influence that will will also have a big impact on the industry. Well, I would even say personally, I'm very thankful that he's always been committed to hiring young leaders because my very first leadership role was at Hard Rock Park in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina in 2008. I was a unit supervisor in attractions operations uh, and VP of operations was John Riggleman. So it'll be really cool actually to uh, touch on some elements of, of that time of that summer uh, from an operating standpoint and, uh, and from that time at Hard Rock Park, along with, uh, you know, all the other, all the other properties and, and parks that he's worked for, uh, as well as tying in um, his commitment to education as well and being an adjunct professor at University of Central Florida at the Rosen College and uh, being committed to, uh, to influencing the next generation of theme park leaders. So I'm noticing a bit of a trend here. We had Linda Rose Hayes, who you worked with, and now we've got John Regelman. Are we just going to be, you know, having guests on that you've worked with before? 
I, maybe we'll see. <laughs> we've well, got I'm, a few more we can reach out to. So. That's right. We we've got a lot of a lot of people we can reach out to, and I'm sure they'd all have fascinating stories about Josh. But before we get to all that, let's get to this great interview with John Riggleman. John Riggleman, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. John, how are you doing today? Good, thank you. How are you? We're doing great. We can't wait to kind of dive into this conversation. So can you give us, first of all, a quick um, rundown of your history in the industry and some of the things you've done? Sure. Uh, and it's, you know, because I've worked in, uh, I think I counted up 10 parks and lived in nine states. Um, it, it could take up too much time, but uh, I'll, I'll weave it in as we talk uh, during this. Uh, my original plan was to uh, pre-med. I was a chemistry major at West Virginia University. Um, and then later on, um, I finished, I got that degree and then I also got a degree in medical technology. But in the summers when I was in school, I started working at theme parks, specifically Cedar Point for two summers and then Bush Gardens Williamsburg for two summers. And that really just gave me uh, the, you know, the passion that I really wanted to stay in, stay in the industry. And at that time, it was really difficult to get hired on full time. This was in the 70s. Um, and so, you know, you, you apply and you get rejected and you apply again and you get rejected. And I just kept going to school and ended up getting a second degree in the process. Uh, and then um, I did get hired uh, in 1980 as a full time area manager at Cedar Point. I was there for 15 years. Um, we got a little restless. I had been to an IAPA and, and kind of got to see what was out there in the industry. Um, and really by luck and a lot of chance, uh, I found out about an opening at Water Country USA. Um, and I basically went, went back to Williamsburg. Uh, that's a, another Bush Garden Park. So I was very excited to join the Bush Garden family again. Um, and then from there, um, I got other opportunities and I, I took advantage of either promotions or opening new parks. And we'll talk about some of the details of that probably later on, but uh, th that was very exciting for me. Um, and then basically finishing off about education, when I was at SeaWorld, I went ahead and got my uh, MBA. Um, so in, in order to possibly help me with, with getting, you know, with advancement or whatever, but um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much the background. <laughs> John, I'm curious. I, I, you know, I never knew that you were a med student. When I think of you, I think theme parks, theme parks, theme parks, and, and operations and risk management and, and all of that. And so curious while you were in school and while you said you were, you were working at Cedar Point, then what was it that kind of flipped the switch to say, you know what, this is, this is my path to go down that road. I, what really made a difference for me was I found that I really enjoyed being outdoors rather than indoors. And I really liked, and I know everybody says this, but I really did enjoy working with people. Um, and uh, that was really it. You know, the, the, the idea of working with literally hundreds of people, you know, at that point they were seasonal. It was a seasonal park up at Cedar Point. So it was every summer, but that was pretty exciting. Um, so it was really about, it's just a very different uh, field in that sense. Um, I like being outdoors. I like working with people. Um, and even when I worked in the laboratory for a period of time, uh, you know, time just went slow. But when you're in a theme park, it's eight o'clock in the morning. And the next thing you know, it's six in the evening and you're still not going, bad, you know, so um, that's pretty much it. That's cool. One of the questions I like to ask people that, you know, have a different schooling than the, the career they ended up in um, is, <laughs> are, are there things that you take from that, that medical background and have been able to apply in operations and safety and, and all the great things you've done in the theme park world? Well, you know, a science major is very detailed. So I, you know, and you're, you're always, you're kind of following a recipe, you're following, um, you know, a, a certain way of doing things. And so I, I became very detailed. I, I would hope, you know, I, I, I think I'm very detailed in my work and the way I approach things. Um, I always try to be organized. So I think I took those things away. Hmm. Nice. That's really interesting. 
And then with all of the parks that you worked at with many of the of the biggest players in the industry what are some of the things that you noticed or maybe you know parallels drawing with one another in terms of the way that they operate or even uh, you know were there any kind of blatant differences between uh, between one compared to another yeah i usually separate them between seasonal parks and year round parks um, seasonal parks and they're very different from each other uh, for example at cedar point Operations was much more involved in the daily policies and procedures um, with ride safety, almost duplicating maintenance procedures on a daily basis in some way, such as at Cedar Point, um, the, my teams added their trains to the roller coaster and, mm -hmm. and took them off the track. Um, that's pretty much not done anywhere else that I know of. And as far as I know, they still do that today. Um, and so we were, you know, we were very involved. Um, as an area manager, uh, we had a team of five people and we did, we did everything uh, preparing for the season. We did our own recruiting, hiring, budgeting, SOP development. All of that was done in, very internally with a group of about five people. Um, we did all of our own purchasing. We had to find our own vendors. Uh, we had to vet prices and we did have oversight from a purchasing manager, but a seasonal park uh, every department really runs their department. Seasonal parks, uh, and one of the detriments uh, that people will say is that the departments are very siloed. Um, they work with themselves. Um, you don't see as much cross-pollination working with other departments in the wintertime. Um, and I think that's always something that we always try to improve upon. So I know that when I was when I was at a seasonal park, you know, we work with other departments, but you had to make an effort to do that because you were set up to do everything within yourself anyway. Um, at a year-round park, you had other departments with specific responsibilities to help you do all those things that I just said. So you had more people writing manuals, more people doing the hiring, the recruiting, um, um, you know, the budgeting. You still you submitted that yourself. But everything else, you really had people that had specific responsibilities to help every department do that. Um, and there are a lot more meetings, a lot more people and a lot more meetings. John, one of the things I noticed when I went from a seasonal park um, and I worked at Universal to a year round park, and you mentioned that there's so many more people doing so many more specific things that at a lot of the seasonal parks I worked at, almost everybody was a park person, right? Even the accountant, you know, maybe started as a ride operator and things like that. When I got to a larger facility and a larger organization, you know, you found people from marketing and, and accounting and, and HR and payroll that, you know, didn't have a lot of experience out in the park. So I'm curious from your perspective, even those back of house areas, how important is it for them to have a knowledge or an, at least an appreciation of what goes out, goes on out in the park? Um, even from a back of house perspective? I, I think it has some importance. Um, now I can tell you that Universal um, at spring break and Christmas, everybody who worked back of house had to spend time in the park uh, on at least you know two, four hour shifts, helping out at somewhere in the park, either food to retail, uh, certain positions at rides uh, that they could be trained to do uh, that were non-safety positions. Um, and I think that helped people to have an understanding of what the product that we were giving the guests, you know, was really based upon. Um, so, but I think it does help. I think that's, that's really interesting with, uh, I mean, during that peak season of bringing the back of house team to the front of house, um, probably just opens up a, a whole new perspective of maybe, you know, what they might be doing back of house that they don't think necessarily impacts the day-to-day -day operation uh, and vice versa, being able to, uh, being able to say, oh, I do this back of house when working with a lot of the front of house teams. When you talk about uh, those differences from one organization to the next. I, what I'm curious about is how that ties into when you're opening a new facility. Uh, you've had experience opening uh, new parks. That's where you and I met uh, at Hard Rock Park. I was, I was on uh, your, uh, your team. I was a unit supervisor when you were uh, VP of operations. And one of the things I remember is that so many people uh, had had experience from whether it was, you know, Universal, Cedar Fair, Bush and SeaWorld, um, some of them with multiple, like you coming in with all of that background. And when it comes to really designing what those processes are, 
uh, what I remember was that, you know, there was, there was definitely no gray area in the areas that were black and white. So something like enforcing a height requirement or like those strict safety protocols, um, but other operational procedures like how many times do you test ride an empty vehicle before you put a, put a rider in it? Is it, is it one time or is it three times? Um, when you're looking at weather policy, do we close outdoor rides when there's lightning within 10 miles or five miles? Do we keep flat rides open during three miles uh, or even just verbiage on signage? So curious how you take all of that with this expertise that's coming to the table where there might be the with small kind of granular differences, but being able to define the new standard operating procedure that is unique and specific to that, that property in that new park. Yeah, new ideas are always great to work with. Um, I was on the opening team at four new parks, um, Bush Garden, Soap City at Cedar Point, Islands of Adventure, Hard Rock Park, as well as on the planning team for several other parks, a couple water parks, um, and then in my career, over 40 new attractions, at least 40 new attractions. At the first three, uh, the company had existing procedures to guide the development of some of the procedures you listed. So signage was already in place. Okay, we had signs at sister parks. We, you know, we wanted to keep the consistency of those signs. So we 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 tend to lean upon the experience in the company uh, for a lot of the procedures, especially if they're related to safety. Where we have some flexibility is on efficiency. And that's something that I always got from my teams every year. Somebody would come in and maybe we had been loading a ride or you know, doing a procedure a certain way, but somebody came up with another way to make that procedure better and make it more efficient. And so those things you can bring into play. The key is everything must be documented, no matter what you do, especially in operations. Whenever we train our employees, we're using an SOP or a training manual, and then we have to stick to that. If we want to make a change, then we need to go, we need to get all the right players involved, maintenance, head of operations, uh, talk to the other parks, and then possibly we can consider a change. Uh, but what we don't want to do is ever go against any previous documentation and have, a, have ourselves to be different from a similar ride at a sister park. Now at Hard Rock, it was different. As you said, it was a new park. Um, the advantage is I got to hire, I was the first person hired in operations, therefore I got to hire my team. Um, so I brought in people from different parks. The, the difference was that since I'd been in the industry and been in some of these parks, I knew kind of what they were bringing in and where conflicts maybe between the people. So it was easier to talk to them about that. But one of the things, and I don't know if you ever heard me say this, but one of my comments was, we're not gonna run the park like a previous park that I worked at. We're gonna run Hard Rock Park. So what are the best ideas? So, you know, in that pre-season, in that, in that development season before the park opened, we sat down and compared what were things that we did and all these different experiences. And then we said, let's develop what we want this park to be. Now that's an advantage we had because we didn't have sister parks. We didn't have a corporate entity. You know, there was no policy mandating that. Now, a couple of things that you mentioned, we do have to go back to the manufacturer. So we, we review all the manufacturer manuals. If they give us direction on what to do in certain weather, for example, then we have to follow that. So we do look to other areas to get some of that information. ASTM has a stipulation in 770 that where they require at least one cycle before you put guests on the ride. And it, it's worded in 770 exactly like that. We're only requiring a minimum of one. But as you probably know, other parks require three, other parks require two. Everybody can exceed that recommendation from ASTM, but you have to at least do one empty cycle. So I hope that answers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And John, you mentioned documentation, which I think is so, so critical. And with so many different places that you've worked, there's probably different styles of documentation or the way that people go about it. And um, one of the things that we wanted to really ask about was, you know, when you were, when you were at Universal, you were the D senior director of global operations standards and harmonization. 
And, you know, when you think about standards and when you think about, you know, everybody kind of doing it the same, and you mentioned the, the sister park concept, I totally understand and, and appreciate how you, you definitely want them to all be the, the same and you want the, the procedures to be the same. Um, so obviously they all have to be documented, but the part of your title that really intrigues me is that word harmonization, because I've never seen that in a title before. So can you dig a little deeper into the harmonization part of that title? Okay. So... But we have to start at the beginning um, and how my job came to be. So first I worked for uh, Pilot's Adventure in 1998 uh, for a couple of years under um, Jeff Polk. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did um, in that process of opening up IOA is we wrote all of our manuals and we wrote them. Um, I had a lot of experience from Cedar Point. That was one of the first things I did there was write manuals. Uh, so we set up a our style of manuals for IOA. 12 years later, when uh, Comcast bought all of Universal, which a lot of people may not be aware of this, but Universal owned 100% of Hollywood, but only 50% of Orlando. And the other 50%, if I'm correct, was always owned or uh, managed by an operating company. Um, and so Blackstone was involved at one point, GE. Uh, uh, in other companies. And so when Comcast bought all of Universal, now we, we had to go back and review all the procedures between all the Universal parks that were now 100% owned by Comcast and make sure that their procedures were consistent, okay? So uh, a department known as Global Standards and Procedures was developed and it existed about a year before I came in. I came in in, in 2000. 12, and I was the director of global standards and procedures. So we worked on um, a format uh, comparing um, at first Hollywood and Orlando. We later added Singapore since they're English speaking. And then we had to, we had to find a way to bring Japan into the mix. So of course, now we had a language barrier. So we came up with another process to evaluate their operations and their procedures um, and it, it gets into a lot of minutiae as to why, why we just didn't translate. Uh, translating is great, but it changes so often. Every time you revise a manual, you got to constantly keep after that. So we did another process to help that uh, be a little bit faster. Um, but meanwhile, when, when uh, I was hired, I was also told that in addition to my current responsibilities of leading this team, uh, that's managing the transparency. And this, by the way, was all departments, front of house, back of house, um, not just operations, maintenance and so on, but it was everybody. Um, I was also told that I had a responsibility to the senior VP of safety and engineering and the senior VP of legal because of uh, the relationship I had developed back when we opened Islands. Um, I work closely with Steve Blum, could work closely with uh, the legal uh, the legal team on accessibility and various safety issues. And so that tied into also, since I was going to all the other parks anyway, um, I also could work on any safety issues that came up uh, between the parks to make sure that we were addressing them in a consistent way. So uh, my title changed uh, several years later and included the word harmonization to really just just to uh, give a name to what I was trying to do between all the parks worldwide. What's the difference then between harmonization and consistency, or are those synonymous? They're synonymous. Okay. We're looking, yeah, you know, we're looking for as much as we can that all of our procedures are consistent. The harmonization was really um, it for me. It dealt with the other projects that I was working on with safety and legal. Uh, because when we when we'd have a situation and we had to to come up with a way to address that, we wanted to address it with all the parks, not just with the park where maybe you know where where it first uh, was realized. Yeah. Um, so what about then taking that standard operating procedure, which is now harmonized across globally from from all the international parks? And then I, I would say using that kind of as 
as the anchor that then turns into even the smallest decisions going down to frontline staff members. So when thinking of it and saying, okay, this is kind of like, this is, this is the, the Bible of, of how everything operates, of then taking that and translating into training and then into execution and then into, uh, into consistently reinforcing that because you, you, not every operator has the manual right then and there every single, every single moment of while they're operating. So kind of taking that and saying, okay, we've defined this, the, the procedure and now we are making sure that the procedure is consistently being, uh, being executed throughout daily operations at all parks across the world. So I think that sounds great on paper. Right. <laughs> um, I think we have to realize that in any company that has multiple parks, um, those parks came together at different points in everybody's, in everybody's career or everybody's, you know, when everybody that was at the park. So in other words, Hollywood has had procedures for decades. Orlando parks had procedures for decades, but they did these independently. Um, it, it, it wasn't efficient to try and come in and say, okay, we're going to write one manual that has to apply to everybody. We allow people to keep, to write their manuals in their own way, in their own style, because everybody writes differently. So now I did work for a company that had a corporate team that wrote manuals for their parks, but that's not something that we had. We didn't, we don't, my team didn't write manuals. We gave them the format. What we did do is we did give the format to all the parks and they had to follow that format. So what comes first in the manual, what comes second, what comes third. The other thing is there are differences between even though rides may have the same name, there are differences between load stations, uh, whether it has one loading station or two loading stations. So there are differences that always have to be accounted for. So it was more efficient and, and it was easier to manage the different, way, the different ways that manuals are being written, but making sure that the, the procedures were identical where they should be identical that helps. Yeah. John, you've got a lot of uh, experience with SOPs and manuals. And one of the questions I get sometimes from people is where do I start? Like if I'm going to start writing an SOP, if I don't have one, if all I've got the manufacturers, you know, recommendations, and I want to start my, my standard operating procedure, where do I start? So what advice do you have somebody like that? Well, I would say start with an introduction. So talk about the ride, you know, you know, what is, what is the ride, what's the ride description? What does it do? Then get all the statistics about the attraction. Usually get that from the manufacturer or you'll uh, do timings and studies when you have the ride. And then we always write our manuals in the order of the day. So pre-opening procedures, daily procedures, emergency procedures, closing procedures. Um, and, and that's it. You know, we just had a certain format so that when you read the manual, it, when you're in training, you're learning it from, here's what happens when I walk onto the ride that morning and this is the process throughout the day. So we always use that same process. Cool. So uh, we mentioned Hard Rock uh, Park a couple of times so far. I wonder if uh, maybe we can revisit it. Uh, for those who are watching this, uh, you've got Myrtle Beach right there in the in the background. You've now uh, relocated to Myrtle Beach, with it, which I think is is so cool. Um, people who did not get the chance to work at Hard Rock Park or visit Hard Rock Park kind of kind of look at it as uh, such an incredible story. Whether I mean some parts positive, some parts uh, you know negative from you know from the the park's uh, I would say history or. Uh, not very long history in the industry of just operating in 2008 and then uh, coming back in 2009 as Free Stick Park. And I, you know, like I mentioned, you know, I worked there. I was, you know, I was like frontline leadership being, you know, VP of operations there. Uh, you know, what do you look back as far as your perspective there? And uh, what do you look at as, as maybe things that could have made the park more of a success? Well, Hard Rock was a beautiful park. It was designed and constructed by the best people in the industry. Many of the people who were on the construction team, the development team of the park were people that I worked with when we built Islands of Adventure. So I knew a lot of those people and making that move from SeaWorld to Hard Rock Park was a really 
difficult uh, decision for me. I had just been promoted like a year before to the senior director. I was doing, interestingly enough, I was doing the same responsibilities for SeaWorld that I ended up doing for Universal, you know, in my last, you know, uh, eight years. Um, so I definitely enjoyed that type of work. Um, but when I went to Hard Rock and I started recognizing faces, um, it, it was very compelling to me to join that team because I really believed that the right people were building the parks that therefore the park was, you know, had every opportunity to be a success. Um, my uh, general manager had worked at Cedar Fair and Bush Gardens Williamsburg. So that told me that he would understand my background and what I came in, you know, and what I believed is the right way to run operations. So I believe that have that support. And then my corporate operations uh, supervisor was from Universal. So I knew him as well when I worked at Islands. So um, it had a great mix of attractions. Um, it had as many attractions that Bush Gardens Williamsburg had when it opened in 1975. Um, it had some of the best food that I've ever tasted. I thought that was, I, I was really impressed by that. And the entertainment was awesome. Okay. And in fact, um, entertainment received two IAPA nominations that fall. Um, so the parts of the park that the guests were going to see were, were definitely, in, you know, definitely inviting, you know, you know, what could go wrong. Right. And I can't really say what went wrong. There are many theories which have been offered. Some say it was the economy. 2008 was a challenging year for all of the industry. Parks had to tighten up. Hard Rock did not have a corporate entity or other parks to shoulder some of the financial load in case it was a tough year. Um, perhaps it was a business plan. Uh, many investors had created a fund of $400 million to fund the construction of the park, but we had to be cash flow positive on day one. There was little to no funds set aside to pay expenses for the first two to three years, as we might have expected to help get that park in the black. And again, that's normal for a new theme park. Um, there are other theme parks um, that have been in the red for almost five years, but they had a corporate entity to help keep that park afloat until um, new attractions or you know, the popularity of the park would help turn it around. Um, some say it was a specific location, okay? The park was located about 10 to 15 minutes from the beach. Um, and the beach, but the beach provided entertainment and restaurants right there on the beach. So guests at the beach didn't have any reason to go anywhere else. Um, what else? Uh, in the 2000s, there were almost 20 million tourists a year to the Myrtle Beach area. So that meant all we had to do was attract 15% of those to come to the park. And that becomes maybe a possibility. Uh, we were told that uh, the business plan had that we would have 3 million guests the first year. Okay, well, that, that sounds okay. That, that doesn't sound daunting, but when you consider that's over only 100 days, that means 30,000 guests a day. Okay, and some seasonal parks, that's a, that's a tough number to hit. Um, I know Cedar Point does north of 3 million, but they've been in existence for 150 years, uh, way north of 3 million. I can't estimate where, but it's, but it's in that, you know, it's in that range. Um, and finally, uh, the price point, the beach is free. When people plan to come to Myrtle Beach, they're expecting basically, you know, it's a free vacation. You know, the, the hotels are not that expensive. Um, the entertainment for the children is all day long on the beach. And the ticket price for Hard Rock was $50 or $50 a person. Um, but it was, it was a beautiful park. So there, like I said, there's a lot of theories uh, and maybe it's a little everything. Yeah, as, as the one guy on this call right now who has not been there, you make me jealous, um, having wanting to go there and, and see it all. But, um, you know, I'm curious, John, when you talk about all these the parks that you've opened, what are some myths or misconceptions that people might have about what it's like to open a brand new property like that? Yeah, it, it's, it is. I will tell you that every, whenever we open a new attraction at Cedar Point, which is where I had, until IOA, you know, I had a lot. I was really deep into the opening of a new attraction at Cedar Point. Um, it's exciting, but 
but it's daunting, you know, because you're, you're going to have downtime, you're going to have challenges when you're getting something, you know, running for the first time. Um, and then you put all of that into a new park and you've got 15 attractions that you're uh, trying to open up. Uh, and we always had a certain time frame. You know, marketing would tell us, you know, there was a decision made years before that the park will open on this date. And so all the plans are to make that happen. And so in order to do that, everybody is doing long hours. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, I had teams that were working overnight for, for weeks and months uh, doing, you know, test runs of new attractions. Um, so, and that's hard on people, you know, there, there's a lot of dedication and enthusiasm. Now I will say that many of those people are still at, you know, at Universal, you know, they're still there, but some people moved on, you know, it's a very daunting prospect to open up a new park. Um, and I think that's, I think that's all I can say on that right now. <laughs> Uh, you just uh, brought back some memories for me from, well, from Hard Rock in particular, where, uh, so my direct supervisor was Jared Ward, a close friend of mine. And mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, working an overnight shift to test a ride, uh, I remember just him walking up to the ride platform at I think nine o'clock at night with a cooler full of Red Bulls and monster energy drinks. And he and I just sat there and, and we just had to get those test cycles in. And even though, yeah, it was exhausting, it's still just one of the coolest experiences um, to be able to be a part of a new park opening Um you know, uh, and, and, you know, after that, I, you know, I was able to be fortunate. I, I opened uh, Legoland, Florida, and I opened Zoomers Amusement Park in Fort Myers. Um, but, you know, I always, I always look at, at Hard Rock as, you know, being, uh, it was, it was the first park I opened and it was also my first role in a leadership position. And that's one of the things too, uh, about one of the, one of the questions we wanted to ask you is that you've hired many young professionals into leadership and into management positions and curious what, what it is that inspires you about working with young leaders. And then the flip side of that too, is, as, uh, as far as any frustrations that come from that as well. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's all started at Cedar Point. Um, when, I, when I started working full-time in the industry, um, and as I mentioned before, we did our own recruiting and hiring uh, for our, our positions for the following summer. So I had 500 positions to fill every summer. And so, again, a very small team of us would, uh, would go to up all the universities within an eight-state region of Cedar Point and recruit for talent for the next summer. And so, you know, I, I became very involved with that. And by the time we got near the park opening, I knew everybody's name that was going to work in my department because I had, I had, I had recruited them, I had hired them, I put them on a staffing list. And so when they came in and started working in the park, all I got, had to do was put a face to the name and I knew, I knew everyone. I couldn't do that today to save me. Uh, to, to learn that many people in, in that amount of time. Um, but I did take that experience to other parks, um, such as SeaWorld and Hard Rock, where we went out and we actually, you know, went to some colleges and recruited people from other colleges to come and work at the park, because it really, it gave us a broader um, field of, of uh, talent to pull from. Um, it became very satisfying to mentor each team each year, and I carried that with me as I moved on to other parks. Um, every summer at Cedar Point, we always had basically three weeks of cleaning that we had to do on all the attractions before the park opened. And we'd bring in a certain number of employees each week to help do that. And everyone will tell you that it's the hardest work they've ever done, but they, in the middle of the summer, they'd do anything to go back and be in those three weeks again, because everyone together worked so closely together. Everyone, the entire area just became friends immediately. And it didn't hurt that everybody lived on property. So there was lots of reason for everybody to know each other. Um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed uh, mentoring people, uh, finding people to uh, give them that first, you know, first promotion into leadership. Um, in a seasonal park, uh, going to the difference between a seasonal park and a year old park, seasonal parks, you're given a lot of responsibility very quickly. So for example, my first year, I was a ride operator for three months. I came back the next summer 
I was a team leader. I came back the next summer and I was an attraction supervisor and that was at Bush Gardens. I came back the next summer and now I'm an area supervisor. So in the course of nine months, I somehow had shown that I could lead several hundred people running you know, a bunch of rides you know, at a park. Seasonal parks do that. They, people move up very quickly. In a year round park, it's much different, okay? There's a lot more people, a lot more competition and people are there for possibly years before they get that first opportunity to get promoted. Um, and, but I enjoy watching people grow into their own. And, and I had the pleasure of promoting people to advanced positions, many of whom are still in the industry in advanced positions now. Um, I've always believed that you hire people who will challenge you. I've learned so much from my employees. I encourage my team to share their ideas and help make, make us all better. And while I'm able, at, at one point, I was able to operate any ride at Cedar Point, but I used to tell people during those training weeks that in one week, you're going to have run your attraction more than I ever have, and I'm going to be now learning from you. And so I need to know what you see, what you hear, what are things that, um, that we may you know, need to be aware of. Um, so inspiration, uh, passion, ideas, enthusiasm, frustration. The summer ended too soon. Um, and at least at a year round park, you had more time with your teams. Yeah. You know, John, you, you mentioned mentoring and, and certainly um, how much you like working with, with young folks. What's some advice that you would give young professionals now um, as they're coming into the industry and what they can do to, to be successful? Okay. Um, find your passion. You know, I, I will tell people, you know, theme parks may be what you want to do, but it may not be what you want to do. But first off, find your passion. Network. Okay, attend ASTM meetings, participate in an engineering competition, go to Ames, NARSO, um, uh, work in a park, um, either as an intern or a seasonal worker. Um, a lot of people go to school now and get a degree in hospitality management. And some people think that as soon as they have that degree that they can just submit their resume and they'll be hired in as a manager at a park. It's probably not gonna work that way. You're probably going to have to take several steps back and show the company what your passion is and, and what you're capable of doing. That degree will open the door for you, but your attitude and how you handle your day-to-day -day responsibility is gonna be the key. Um, be willing to get your hands dirty. Um, some of the best students I've met work as, a work as maintenance interns um, at an amusement park on the night shift or frontline employee on a ride. Uh, and I'm really impressed by that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people that I've met recently through ASCM and through the Ryerson competition, um, if they're not able to secure an internship, they go to a seasonal park and they get hired in, uh, in as a uh, maintenance, uh, as a mechanic. Um, be open-minded, flexible, comfortable with change. Okay. Um, kind of going back before, you know, when, when we opened Islands, we actually had training classes on helping people adjust to the fact that there was a new park being built to be comfortable with change, uh, what it means to be part of a whole new park opening up next door. Um, Cause we, we knew that it was going to be challenging. Um, attention to detail, okay? I look for those people. I, I look for people that are perfectionists. Um, that's who I can trust, okay? Cause if I give them a project, I know they're going to you know, be, you know, do their, their best to be perfect at it. Um, intense focus, perseverance. And again, a degree will help you have greater knowledge, but your skills and attitude will impress the people who are hiring. And I cannot emphasize attitude enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, John, you mentioned the Ryerson University and Thrill Ride competition. I'm wondering if uh, you can expand a little bit on that and the work that you've done with it. Sure. Um, well, first off, uh, this is Dr. Catherine Woodcock. Of, uh, she's a professor at Ryerson University. It's her brainchild. In 2014, she developed this competition and she invited several schools to come to Ryerson University for um, a three to four day competition. And I don't know the exact number. I'm going to guess she had probably about 12 students there that year from Ryerson University and two or three other schools. Um, my uh, 
safety and engineering uh, VP at Universal uh, was asked to be a judge at that competition in 2014. When he came back, um, he mentioned it to uh, Dr. Paula Stinsler, who is an engineer at Universal at that time, and, uh, and myself, uh, that he wanted that competition to be moved to Orlando. Uh, and it was scheduled, uh, the next one was scheduled to be in 2016. So Paula and I worked with uh, Dr. Woodcock and we uh, set up the event at Universal in 2016. We had four schools, 16 students. Um, from, we had four schools and we did it the weekend before IAPA. So now Dr. Woodcock and, and Dr. Sinsler came up with the challenges. I mostly did all the logistics uh, for holding the event at Universal and it was such a success. And of course we wanted to do it the next year. And instead of going every two years, we decided to start doing it every year. So based on that, we held the next event in 2017. This time we hosted 48 students um, from, I wanna say eight schools and then 80 students in 2018 and then 120 students uh, in 2019 from 16 schools. We now have over 30 schools that want to be invited to the competition. So the, the numbers are just exploding. Um, let's see, uh, what else can I say about it? Um, it? It was just, it was a great event. Uh, the challenges are very, uh, they're very private. Uh, the students are not allowed to talk about them. Um, they get, uh, there's a total of seven or eight challenges and they can sign up for as many as they want to sign up for they get information on two of the challenges ahead of time. So they basically will prepare a presentation for um, the afternoon of the first day, but everything else is held secret until one another challenge is revealed a week before and then the rest of them, the other five are revealed the morning of the first day. So then they have less than 48 hours to develop their presentations on these remaining presentations. And we're, and then we're watching these presentations from Friday afternoon through Monday morning. Um, and it's amazing what they come up with. They, they do such a great job. Now this year we couldn't do an in-person. Uh, so we did a virtual, we just wrapped up the virtual competition. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of who was involved this year. Um, Steve and Catherine asked me to, to be a judge once again um, I always tell them I'm not the engineer, but they keep wanting me to be on this judge, be as a judge for engineering students. Um, but we had eight, is it eight, maybe 12. Um, we had between eight and 12 teams on our challenge. So, um, but I, I apologize. I don't know the exact number that participated this year, but we're hoping to go back. Um, we're planning for an in-person event 2022 now. That's fantastic. And to hear how it has exploded over the years. And I, I can imagine that 2020 is just a little bit of a blip and 2022 will be, or 20, you know, your next one will be um, that much, that much better. Um, you know, there, there's kind of a trend in a lot of things you're talking about with getting involved with young professionals and hiring young people and, and getting their, getting their feet in the door and that kind of thing. Um, and you've also taught at UCF at the Rosen School. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how you've translated all of your experience into academia. So in 2001, I believe it was, um, the Rosen College uh, developed a uh, theme park advisory board. Um, it was under the leadership of Dr. Audie Millman and Dr. Duncan Dixon. Um, I unfortunately didn't know about the very first meeting, so I don't get the history of being there from the very beginning, but I was invited for the second meeting. Um, and we put together uh, the, the, the responsibility at that time was for all the board members uh, to help develop classes for the theme park track at Rosen College. So um, many of us got together and then we would bring in um, basically an outline of a class. 
Um, and so then Dr. Millman and Dr. Dixon took all those outlines and they developed an entire theme park track. Um, so uh, we met every year. Uh, we then, after that project was done, then we started working on internships uh, for the theme parks. And I was at SeaWorld at that time. So uh, we were one of the first ones to have an internship um, uh, track at, at SeaWorld. And we'd hire five students from Rosen and we'd put them through a pretty aggressive uh, eight week uh, rotation from being a frontline employee all the way to, to being a supervisor. Like literally we gave them that responsibility under supervision, but we walked them through and had them shadow and then do the responsibility. Um, and what was interesting is at least I want to say at least two of the interns that I had at SeaWorld at one point were people that I did hire to be supervisors at Hard Rock Park later on. Um, so it was it was exciting for me to be able to still keep people involved in the industry. Um, I had left Orlando for a period of time. I'd, I've gone to Hard Rock and then I went out west for a couple years. And when I came back and started working for Universal again, um, Dr. Millman asked me if I would take on the chairmanship of the theme park advisory board. So I started that in 2012, I believe it was. And then I held that role until I retired last year. Um, and at the same time, uh, when I came back, Dr. Millman knew that I had received my MBA. So he goes, well, now you can teach. <laughs> so I started off teaching um, just an introductory course for Rosen College, but then Dr. Dixon came to me and said, hey, we want to introduce a risk management class. Can you develop a, an outline for that class? So I developed an outline, turned it in, and he goes, great. He goes, the board's accepted it, but only if you teach it. <laughs> so then I started teaching risk management, and then later on I inherited a product development class. So uh, overall, about eight semesters, I, I taught um, mostly risk management and product development at Rosen College. That's awesome. Um, no, that's that's really cool that you've been able to make that type of an impact, not only as a leader in the industry for so many years, but now also helping to influence from the academic standpoint of, of being able to teach all of that in the classroom. So uh, what an amazing, amazing contribution to the industry. Uh, you mentioned that you retired last summer, July 2020. Uh, first of all, congratulations on that. And what, uh, what have you been doing with your retirement? How are you uh, staying connected to the industry? Because obviously you haven't completely gone away. <laughs> no, I've not completely gone away. And, you know, I was hoping to travel. Um, but as we all know, that's been a little bit curtailed. Uh, I can do a little bit in the U.S., but uh, I'm waiting for other uh, opportunities to travel coming up. Um, but I, um, I've been involved with mostly in the last year, NARSO and ASTM, um, also a little bit with Ames. Um, I started out uh, getting involved with Ames as an instructor back in about 2012, and I started teaching classes at their annual uh, Ames seminar. When I came back and joined Universal, um, one of the one of the the people that I worked with asked me if I would also get involved with NARSO because they had just taken on uh, teaching operations classes. So I uh, joined up with um, Laura Woodburn um, uh, at Hershey Park, and um, she did an amazing job. She developed a whole operations class, and you know, the first year I went up just to be there to help. Um, and uh, but now, a couple years later, then Laura asked me just to take it on. So now I'm the um, education coordinator for the operations classes at NARSO. So that's keeping me a little bit busy. ASTM, I started with them in 2005. And in uh, 2010, I became the sub-chairman for F2440, which is the operations um, committee. Uh, specifically, we had one standard F770. Um, I stayed in that role until last year, last February of 20. And I uh, turned that over to uh, somebody from Hershen Entertainment, who's now taking on uh, 2440. And I moved over to, um, I'm now the vice chair for F2420, which is uh, terminology and specifications, and I'm the task group leader for terminology. So I've stayed busy with those activities. 
And then meanwhile, uh, I still got uh, the Ryerson competition. So I'm doing that uh, with Catherine and, and Steve. Um, I will say, since you probably have students that might see this presentation, we always invite students to come to the ASTM meetings every year. Um, I realize the last two have been virtual, but normally uh, the meetings are in February and October. You can always check on the website or you'll get my uh, way to contact me at the end of this if you want to know information on the next ASTM meeting. Um, it's actually October. I'm going to say something like 13th to the 16th in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's one of the best meetings that I've ever gone to. A lot of work gets done, but then there's also a lot of fun. Uh, with all the people that you meet, you definitely get to network with some of the people in the industry that are hiring. Um, you know, you know, management major, majors or mechanical engineers. I mean, there's lots of contacts that you can make at ASTM. Um, let's see. I, oh, I, oh, I also wanted to mention this too. Uh, you know, everybody thinks that all the theme parks are competitors, and we are. When you go to Orlando, you've got, so you could almost count up and say you got at least 12, if not more than that, parks in that general area of Orlando and Tampa. And yes, the theme parks are competitors uh, to a degree, but when it comes to safety, everyone are fierce friends, okay? And the thing about ASTM is you go to ASTM and you could be sitting with somebody from several other parks and you're sharing ideas and solutions and you know, when it comes to safety, there's no barriers to the conversations that we can have. We just can't, we can't, we have to watch our, uh, you know, proprietary uh, information. But in, in a general sense, you know, we all talk. Um, I've been on many trips, uh, again, courtesy of people that I work with at Universal. Um, uh, Steve sent me on several trips with ASTM to Latin America. Um, I also attend the, we have ASTM meetings in um, the Asia and European meetings. And again, we're talking, you know, I'm there with, with people from Disney, people from Whitewater, you know, uh, manufacturers and parks alike. Um, and again, we're, we're really just promoting safety. You know, my personal mantra is you never know what accident you prevented by being safe. Hmm. And so when people question me, like, I'm like, okay, please don't use the trash can as a ladder. Oh no, it's really sturdy. I can do this. Yeah. Come on down. You know, let me go get you a ladder. Uh, but you never know if I had just driven by or walked by and not said anything. And then you never know what would have maybe happened five minutes later. So you never know what accident you prevent by being safe. Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at safety in general, um, because there are so many, unfortunately, shortcuts that people can take and that they do take because it's quicker, it's easier, it's more efficient, um, like standing on a trash can. Um, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right that you never know what you can prevent if you, if you take a look at it that way. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier that we're going to get your contact information, and we are going to do that. But before that, I wanted to know, where are you looking forward to traveling to? You mentioned places uh, like the U.S. So I'm just curious, where do you want to go? Um, I really love Europe. Um, I, you know, my first opportunity in going to Europe was, I think, 2015. I was going over for an ASTM IAPA meeting. And I took advantage of already being over there. So I took a couple extra days of my own and I, and, and I've done this several years. I've been to Scotland, Ireland, Amsterdam, Norway, uh, Germany, France. And, you know, I, I got to see Europa Park. Um, I got to see incredible landscapes in Ireland and Scotland, castles. Uh, and in that process, you know, I, I, I did make some very good friends in those, in those countries that, you know, and that I love to, you know, love to hang out with when I go. So I'm not sure the list, first of list is probably England, Norway, uh, but I also want to get back to Germany as well. I, I want to go back and see uh, Europa Park. Um, they have done a lot of improvements. They've opened a water park. Um, they were extremely gracious and hospitable to me when I was there before. And I'm anxious to see uh, what the park looks like today. Mm. Awesome. 
Well, no, I, I think that is a great note to end on as we start to wind this down. So, John, if people want to get a hold of you directly or uh, say hi to you on Dan, just send them. Um, just uh, go to LinkedIn and just uh, put in my name. Uh, if you're not connected to me, uh, then connect to me. Um, if if I don't know how LinkedIn works, if you're not connected, if you can get somebody, if you can send a message, uh, my, my email is thomasjt at aol.com. I'm one of the few people left, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, I still have my AOL account. So um, I, I'll, I can watch for emails there. I get a lot of spam, but I'll try to be careful and not delete too quickly. Um, but in LinkedIn is usually how people find me. Cool. Uh, well, John, this was a phenomenal interview. We are so glad we had the opportunity to chat with you today. So thank you so much uh, for your time and for everyone out there who is watching and listening. Uh, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.